All right, Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. Lesson number two in the series entitled Mature Enough for Marriage. So I'll make a general statement to start. Most adults are either anticipating marriage, experiencing marriage, getting out of a marriage, or are experiencing a second or subsequent marriage. Everybody is somehow tied to marriage. Each situation is different, some more satisfying than others, but every one of these experiences that I've mentioned shares a common goal or a common desire. Everyone contemplating marriage wants it to succeed. I've done a lot of weddings in you know, 39 years of being a minister. A lot, of, a lot of weddings for very young people all the way up to older people. And I've never heard of anyone who is getting married, even for a second, even for a third time, who thought or hoped that it would fail. <laughs> the attitude is always, this time is going to work. Even the uh, much married actress, remember her, Elizabeth Taylor? Some of you younger people might not remember her, but very famous in her day. She was a very much married individual. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor said that every time she got married, it was for life. And she was married seven times. <laughs> so, it goes to prove that the hope to succeed in marriage is always there, even for those who fail at it. They want to succeed. Of course, merely wanting a marriage to succeed is not enough. So in this lesson, we're going to review several factors that'll help determine if and when a person is mature enough to enter into marriage. So the first thing that we need to look at here, first thing that mature couples need to know in order to succeed at marriage is the difference between romance and love. There's a difference. Romance is the idealized version of what we want someone to look like and to act like and to treat us. That's romance. Love, on the other hand, is a commitment to make another person's welfare equal to our own and the personal discipline to maintain that commitment. That's the definition of love. Romance is in Hollywood movies. It's fun, it's candy, it's great, it tastes good, it's chocolate. Love is seen at the hospital as one spouse cares for another over a long period of time. Of course, every marriage needs romance. I'm not discounting the need for romance. You know, every marriage needs a spark, needs an idealistic element, but romance alone cannot make a marriage last a lifetime. Only love can do that. Now those who are mature enough to marry understand that there's a difference between romance and love. And I'd like to review some of those differences now. So let's, let's start with romance, shall we? First thing about romance is that it produces the wrong expectations. In previous times, men and women actually prepared themselves consciously for marriage. Women saved what they needed in order to start a home. You know, they say they, they collected you know, pots and pans and dishes and things and, 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 and linen and all kinds of things. They, they began early on, even before they had a boyfriend. They started collecting that stuff. They were specifically trained in caring for a home and children. And men assumed that they would support a family and they worked and they trained with this in mind. 
This was the point. Marriage and family was actually a goal in itself. You were shooting for that. It wasn't kind of an add-on. It was the objective. Most marriages were arranged or there was not much dating or contact until the couple was actually married and living together. Now when I say in previous times, I'm not talking about the 90s. <laughs> I'm talking about the 1890s, not the 1990s. In those times, their love grew out of the shared experience of having a home and raising a family. Today, we prepare for marriage by idealizing our future mate. Sorry. We work on our image or our look and we seek a similar or a matching image. Once we found our ideal, then we learn to live together. Now the difference between the two methods is that a century ago people knew how to live together, but they learned how to love. Today we search to fall in love with a romantic ideal and then we learn to live together. See the difference? Now one method begins with very little emotional investment and it grows with knowledge and practice. That was the old days. The modern method begins with a total emotional investment and a very high expectation and then must adapt to a lesser reality. I mean, wait a minute. Your boyfriend asks you to marry him by hiring a plane to drag a sign that's 60 feet long across the sky that says, Judy, will you marry me? Where do you go from there? How do you top that? So this is what happens when long-term relations are based solely on romance. Another thing about romance. Romance demands perfection. The intensity of our feelings in romance are produced by the idealistic way we view our beloved. We're filled with this fantastic feeling about this person, but suffer terribly when this feeling drops even just a little bit. Oh, it's so wonderful, I'm in love. It's, oh man, alive. you can't believe how I feel. I'm so alive, but it's wonderful. You know? And if it drops just in one little iota, uh-oh. Does that mean it's not going to work? You see, romance is not about building something. It's about maintaining this ideal that we have about someone else. So when the feeling stops or slows down, in our society, we look for someone else to give us that feeling. That's what happens with movie stars. They have the fame and the money and the power and the freedom and the mobility to say, well, that's not working. Hello, Mr. Lawyer. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think this thing is happening here. Could you just make, you know, do the paperwork you know, and uh, I'll tell my personal assistant you know, to pack up my stuff find me a place to stay. You know, my publicist will put out a, a thing that, yeah, we're, we love each other, but we've decided to go separate ways. Really? But in our lives, ordinary people, when you stop, quote, romantically loving someone, it, it gets pretty messy. Romance, emphasizes the wrong things. Romance looks for the spark, the flash, the fire, and will often reject a potential partner who may be emotionally, socially, and spiritually suitable to us, but they don't have the spark. Romance is nourished mainly by physical intimacy. Romance searches for a partner that looks good, feels good, but too many times ignores issues of character and adaptability and comfort, all things which make a long-term relationship actually work. 
And of course, romance doesn't take advice. You can't give advice. Romantic couples feel they don't need the benefit of counseling or teaching or guidance because what they feel is what is important. And in doing this, they miss out on important information and many times because of that head for disaster. Hey, I'm not against romantic love. Let's put it this way. It's a component, but it's not the whole picture. Okay? Let's talk about love. The other component often missing in a relationship is love. We talk about love, but usually we confuse it with romance. There are many emotions we feel when, we've, when we're involved with someone, but here's the definition of true love. Love is a commitment to make another's welfare equal to one's own and the discipline to maintain that commitment. Note the two major elements in love. The first. The first is a commitment. A commitment to consider someone else's welfare equal to my own. This is the highest form of human love. When people marry, they don't just promise to be each other's spouse or be faithful. They promise to love. You know, remember the vows? Do you take this woman, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, wife? And do you promise to, what's the first word? Do you promise to love? And then the other things. Why the first word love? Because it, 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 it encompasses everything else. You don't even have to say the other stuff. You could just say in your vows, I promise to love you, period, that's it. No other vows necessary. If it's what we're talking about, real love. The promise, the commitment is to do this, whether the other person is ill or well or rich or poor or lovable or unlovable, when you marry, you're taking on the responsibility to care for someone else as well as you care for yourself. That's love. You can build a life on that type of love. You know, for guys, and I'm a guy, so I, I see things from a guy's perspective. Yeah, on the wedding day, wow, she's a knockout. On the wedding day, she's a knockout. Are you kidding me? She spent like three days getting ready with the hair and the makeup and the dress and she, you know, she's, she's been working out. She's toned. It's great. It's marvelous. And you love her so much. And you double love her when she's pregnant. Oh man, she's, oh, she's so gorgeous and big and swollen and full of life and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's have another one. Yes, I'm into it. She's so beautiful. But then she has three and then, you know, you begin to see the wear and tear that babies have on a woman's body. And not only on her body, but on her mind and on her emotions. So it's no more 11 o'clock. Hey, let's go out and get some pizza and watch a movie all night. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> I got to get up with the babies. Yeah, there's no romantic love there. That's when the real love kicks in or better kick in. And that's the other element that's required. Discipline. We don't promise self-discipline but we'll need self-discipline if we're to carry out our promise to love. My commitment to make the other person's welfare equal to my own requires me to control my own selfish impulses. For example, I promised 
you know, I promised, you know, my wife, I, I promised I was going to pick her up at 10 p.m., no problem, I'm, I'm with my buddies, I'm watching the game, 10 o'clock I'm picking you up because you've got to go to your mom's, and it's 9.45, and the score is tied, and it's going into overtime, and it's going to take me 20 minutes to get over, and I said I was going to pick you up at 10 o'clock, what do I do? I love her, I do, but there's this new woman at the office. She's awfully nice, reminds me of her on our wedding day. Buff, tone, lots of good makeup, blah, 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 blah. And you know what, she's kind of looking at me and she, I don't know, we sure hit it off. And I feel attracted. What do I do? I'm tired, she's tired, the baby is crying at 3 a.m. What do I do? You see, psychologists tell us that some people are unable to love, not because they don't feel attracted to other people, but because they lack the self-control and discipline that it takes to care for another person's welfare like we care for our own welfare. Some people are just too selfish to love, or they're too immature to love. They're not too immature to be romantically engaged, but they're not mature enough to love. And you've got to build on love. Relationships that build on the basis of love can look forward to a lifetime of love as their experience. Here's how it works. See my little diagram there? A commitment to another's welfare as our own, that's at the core. You start with that. And then you add the other elements that make this relationship unique and enjoyable. So you add to that physical attraction and admiration and common interests and shared goals and building a family and you know, owning a business together and whatever else you want to whatever else you want to add to that. But at the core is that commitment to, to make sure that you are caring for that other person in the way that you yourself want to be cared for. So when this kind of love is at the core, it becomes a joy to add other layers of interest and mutual service as the years go by. But if something else is at the core of a relationship, yeah, we both like money. <laughs> we hit it off because we both worked, you know, and we both like money. We, we, we like making money, spending money, we like money. And, you know, and, and it, it kind of fuels our thing you know, because we like money. Well, yeah, that'll get, you, that'll get you a ways down the road, but it won't get you through a lifetime. Or we like sports, or we like show business, or we like whatever, it doesn't matter. We like cars. We're both into dancing. We met at, the, we bet we met at a club and she down, I like to dance, and we like to go out and we like to dance. Great, good, fun. Wonderful. Yeah, it won't take you very far. Like I said, if something else is at the core of a relationship, it will not and it cannot support the difficulties and complexities of a life lived as a couple. All right, so knowing when you're ready. <clears throat> the one question that most uh, counselors get from, uh, now this is for younger people, when do I know I'm ready or mature enough for a committed relationship or a marriage? It's also a question that people should ask themselves who have already been married. It's the number one mistake that people, divorced people, what I call unmarried people, the number one mistake they make. They think because they've been married, they know everything about marriage, so they don't need to have any information about I know about marriage, I've been married twice. Nobody can tell me about marriage, I, I know all about it. Well, no, you, you failed at marriage twice. So maybe you should take a course first before you try it again. Each person is different 
and there are no easy answers, but there are certain signs or attitudes that tell you that you or someone else is mature enough to go ahead with a serious relationship like marriage. And here are a few things. You know what to look for. You know you're ready when there's some self-control there. Can I make myself do what I should and not do what I shouldn't do? You know, if you're always saying to your boyfriend and your Think your future husband, ah, oh, you're a mess. <laughs> you totaled the car, ah, oh, you're a mess. Uh, you, got, you came in late for work the second or the seventh time and, and, and you got fired, ah, oh, Joey, he's such a mess. You know, you, you, yeah, <laughs> beware. If neither partner assumes responsibility for setting and keeping limits in behavior, the couple will be in trouble within themselves and within society. Yeah, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, they, were a, they were a nice couple, but you see what happened to them. Their marriage ended early. <laughs> the ideal is that both partners have self-control so that both partners receive the benefit from the other. But when it's always one partner that has to set the limits, and maintain control, you have a parent-child relationship. That's not a marriage. When it's always her that has to say, well, that's, isn't that too much? Aren't we going too far? Isn't that, aren't we spending way too much that, you know, that we, money we don't really have? Or, you know, whatever, when it's always her you know, the, the, that the couple is depending on to set the limits, to hold back, to you know, just to exercise some self-control. That's not a marriage. That's parent and child. If you or your partner still haven't taken control of your life, your morals, your responsibilities, you're not ready to be married. Another sign you're not ready or that you are ready. Personal happiness, ask yourself, am I happy in the state that I am, let's say, as a single person? If you can't be happy as a single person, chances are that you won't be happy as a married one either. Many people think that marriage will bring happiness. Marriage doesn't bring happiness, it's an opportunity for one person to bring happiness to another person. Unhappy people don't become happy because they marry. Again, Hollywood and romance novels promote this idea and many are disappointed by it. If you're a happy single person and willing to make someone else happy with you in marriage, go ahead, you're ready. I would say you can be happier in marriage more opportunities for fulfillment and so on and so forth. But if you're walking around depressed and think that, well, you know, I'm depressed, so if I get married, automatically that'll make me happy. No. Deal with your depression, get medication, see a doctor, don't get married, thinking that it'll cure your depression. Values, another question to ask is, do I really know what I believe and what is important to me? A lot of relationships don't work out in the long term because people don't yet know who they are or what they want to be. When they find out, many times they find that it's not compatible with the partner that they have. Wait a minute, you're telling me you don't want to be a teacher anymore? You want to become a ballet dancer? Well, wait a minute, I didn't sign up to be married to a ballet dancer, George. <laughs> a little delayed reaction there. When they find out, many times they find out that, you know, that's not who I wanted to be married to. Make sure you're thinking and sharing with your partner what your hopes are and dreams are for yourself so that you are on the same track in the future. That's what, you know, people say, that's what you ought to be talking about. Unfortunately, what happens, one year before, will you marry me? Yes. When will we get married? Well, it's uh, June. How about next June? Okay. So now for the next 12 months, what are we talking about? 
We're talking about the wedding for 12 months. The wedding and the honeymoon for 12 months. The thing that's going to take two hours. And they're all the same. It takes months to prepare. The two people walk up the aisle, they say a couple of words, then they turn around and they walk back down the aisle. This takes a year to prepare and costs $20,000. I tell people, elope, go to Italy for three weeks, but they don't take my advice. How do you know you're ready? You have some emotional stability. How well do I control my feelings? Wide mood swings or extreme emotions over small matters are a sign of two problems. One, low self-esteem. Wild mood changes are a sign of a fragile esteem of oneself. One sign anyways. And immaturity. Immature people don't think, they simply react without reasoning or restraint. It's difficult living with someone whose mood you can't measure or who uses their moods to try to manipulate you. Life is very long in a marriage when all you do is try to figure out what your partner, you know, what mood they're in, so you know, how to, you know how, what kind of action you're supposed to, to take. If your moods control you, marriage will only aggravate the problem. Be careful. And one other sign that you may not be ready, your relationship with your parents. Of course, this may not relate to those of you who are a little older, but younger people, this is important. Ask yourself, have I developed a good adult to adult relationship with my parents? Young people learn to relate to other people by relating to their parents. For example, a person overly dependent on parents will have difficulty adapting to a partnership in marriage. You know, if he's always saying, well, you know, yeah, that's a good idea, but I, I should talk to my mom and then I'll let you know. Since when does mom have a vote? Mom doesn't have a vote, dad doesn't have a vote. I say to our own children, I appreciate if, if I'm allowed to give an opinion if, if you want my opinion, I'm happy to give you my opinion, but I don't have a vote. In your marriage, only two votes, you know, the two partners, they're the only ones that have a vote. Mom doesn't have a vote, grandma doesn't have a vote, nobody else has a vote except those two people. A person rebelling against parents also brings problems into the marriage that need and should have been solved with the parents. How many times has one partner in the marriage taking out on the other partner things that should have been settled with dad or with mom? So a mature person is not tied to parents, but rather honors them by the way they live and manage their own lives and the way they live and manage their own marriage. Again, parents, with permission, and I say this, parents with permission have a right to give their experience, uh, their opinion based on their experience. I say with permission because if permission isn't giving, then it's intrusion. It's intrusion, butting in, interfering, Marriages are hard enough to kind of you know, build and develop without having third parties always you know, throwing in their two cents worth. Well, those are some of the things <coughs> excuse me, to look at when trying to understand if you're mature enough for a serious relationship that includes marriage. So after this first session, some people may be feeling you know, pretty good that they're in good shape, have a great relationship. Others may be thinking, man, I'm not ready. What am I going to do now? Especially some people sometimes hear this lesson, they're already married. <laughs> thinking, oh dear boy, we got work to do. <laughs> Just realize that if you've chosen to come to this course, you've demonstrated the most important quality necessary in having a successful relationship, and that's the willingness 
to learn. Proverbs says, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. The thing about successful marriages, whether you're contemplating one or you're in one, is that it's a learning process and it continues to be a learning process at every stage of the game. And, and, and it's always beneficial if you're willing and open to learn things because marriages change. You know, they, 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 they work one way, you know, the first kind of 10 years or so, and then they, they, they evolve and they develop as children grow up. As you get older, other elements come into play. They're different. And, and the wonderful thing about marriage <clears throat> that I have found, this is a personal anecdote here, is that God has put in blessings, certain blessings, at every stage of the marriage relationship that, is, that are unique to that stage of the marriage. There are some things that take place and things that you feel in the first 10 years of marriage that are marvelous and wonderful. There's nothing to replace them. And they happen, you know, let's say in that first 10 years or so, that do not happen in the 50th year of marriage. But I tell you, there are things that happen in the 50th year of marriage that are a tremendous blessing and a wonderful experience that are not possible in the first 10 years of marriage. And the marvelous thing is that God Himself has placed these things, these blessings, at every stage of the relationship to help us and to reward us for remaining faithful and hanging in there and you know, keep on going all the way to the end of our lives with the partner that we have chosen. Okay. So hopefully in the lessons to come, you'll be able to learn and apply some of these important principles that will help you to you know, know, what, know where you're going if you're an unmarried person, know how to make better the relationship you already have. Next week, title of the lesson, What to Look For in a Man. We'll start with that, what to look for in a man. And then of course, the following one will be <clears throat> what to look for in a, in a woman. We are dismissed, thank you very much.